Helen asked whether I wanted to preach on the cross as the lectionary for the day or transfiguration and maybe some of you, if you had the same choice, would say, yeah, transfiguration sounds, sounds a little more positive, but they're connected together. The communal project in creating a center of worship placed this version of the cross before us. I guess I should ask you today what color it is. Is it white and gold or black and blue? Uh, <laughs> well, representing the transfiguration of Christ, it's white and silver, making it, as they said, dazzling white, but reminding us that Jesus' transfiguration occurred after Peter recognized him as the Messiah. It also has kind of lavender purple. That symbolizes Jesus' somber announcement that he would be a suffering Messiah, that the transfiguration white is streaked with Lenten purple is appropriate. It was atop a high mountain and within the cloud of God's presence that this ultimate mountaintop experience prefigured the resurrection and Christ in glory. It's recounted in all three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and linked to words about Jesus' passion and death, his rising. God's, uh, John's gospel instead speaks constantly of Jesus' glorification as a kind of a, a symbol or a, uh, an equivalent to transfiguration and sees him as the light of the world. All the glory and radiance of Jesus on the mountaintop may blind us to the question of why he took Peter and James and John with him to the peak of Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon. It appears that he wanted them not only to understand him as Messiah, but to see in his transformation, the beginning of their own inner transformation and the beginning of the transformation of the whole world into God's own kingdom. The disciples were changed, they were transformed, and in their metamorphosis, the church was begun. And in the church is the promise of our own transformation. It's the same word in Greek, uh, transformational, transfiguring, a reality that is available to, I have to say, nearly everyone, let's say to every sighted person and some auditory phenomenon perhaps to others. Maybe at the time we change from daylight time to standard, you awaken to an unusual sunrise. The clouds are just right, so what began as a rosy orange glow on the horizon spreads to one line of clouds, then to another, until nearly the whole sky is patterned in red and orange streams of cloud light, perhaps never seen before or never noticed. Too rapidly, it's changing for any still photo, and too broad in scope to fit in video. It is an experience, and then it is over and gone. A whole day can be changed by a few moments of such a sunrise. And when the day is changed, this optical phenomenon and the day may be remembered for years. This demonstrates that transformation and transfiguration is more than a metaphor of words for a fleeting experience. It's a discernible phenomenon and experience, and as such, it is an indication of the reality of God's very glory around us, perhaps all the time. Now, this came to me as I remembered a poem from years ago, kind of the Easter experience, the early Easter. Funny little poem. We vainly talk of nature's laws but do things have a natural cause? Black earth becoming yellow crocus is undiluted hocus pocus. Transformations abound. If the Bible compilers intended the transfiguration account to be a little Easter, it may 
help some that we have tr if we have trouble getting our minds around the big Easter resurrection reality we have this experience of that transcendence here on the mountain Christ is glorified and the world is seen literally in a new light an unforgettable new light yet life goes on as Jesus predicted with sin and suffering his own suffering and the suffering of others made bearable by the memory of those moments of glory at the very least a person's attitude and orientation and inner spirit can be transformed the Apostle Paul in his letters describes faith in Jesus Christ as having this effect on the believer just looking at Jesus and in 2nd Corinthians he says all of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord the Spirit and in Romans he asks and pleads be transformed by the renewing of your minds it does not yet appear he says what we shall be we may want an instant makeover for ourselves but that's not what Jesus offered to his disciples and to us his kingdom parables are more indicative of what we can expect we each grow in our spirits as slowly yet as dependably as the mustard seed and as the ear comes from the blade in the growing of the grain Bradley Cooper interviewed about how he became such an exemplary depiction of American sniper Chris Kyle described months of intensive study and physical workouts to become a Christian what study what practice what workouts do you think are needed how much do you really want to be like Jesus if we want to be transformed I suppose we have to be willing to climb some kind of a mountain maybe a big mountain if spiritual growth is really a long transformation process then it ought to be an intentional transformation it may mean commitment to a long educational discipline for the renewing of our minds spiritual formation is character formation that takes time perhaps even a lifetime each new job may require an inner spiritual reorientation and transformation or as Jim Beeson might testify to us each new volunteer experience may require reorientation and transformation it's caught this trend this um, transformation or this experience first in a moment and then reflected in a lifetime how long will you persist in your intentional growth and educational transformation a teacher a member of a disciple congregation well into retirement finally made her will not surprisingly leaving most of her assets to three causes of course her church medical research and a peacemaking advocacy organization she was asked how did you get to be a radical pacifist after collecting your social security and the teacher replied nobody has explained to me why I should stop learning just because I retired nobody's explained to me why I should stop learning just because I retired well I've read that the Christian Church disciples is distinguished by having more teachers per capita than any US denomination and perhaps teachers and retired teachers will be our hope for transformation the worship life of a church helps I can't explain to you how you will catch something of transfiguration or transformation in a worship service the words and the music may not resonate with your quest on any given day but 
often the structure and the setting helps. A small stone church in England was built 150 years ago and remodeled about 50 years ago with a gold curtain behind the large carved communion table. So just as the summer solstice flashes a narrow beam through the prehistoric stone hinges and wood hinges in that country, so near the winter solstice, a broad stream of light from a window something like our choir window would come down dependably at 11 o'clock to hit that gold curtain and light from a star billions of years old would shine in and transform the chancel and transfigure it. Worship then and there still, still sustains us here and now. It's sobering to remember that Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice used the word transformation to describe what she hoped and planned for in Iraq and the Middle East. Not all of what we experience as massive transformation is positive success. Recent discussion between city planners, developers, and local churches about what happens across the street and across the street should be carefully and cautiously handled in relation to the good news of transformation. Because one truism we have to accept is that change is inevitable. The world was created by our God as a dynamic entity. Transformation and change will come. Many people probably think Kirkwood comes from a church out in the woods, like the Little Brown Church in the Wildwood. But Kirkwood wasn't named for that. It was never that and never will be. It was named for a university professor. And preserving our ecclesiastical heritage isn't for us a big enough goal for this little church. Relating to a growing university is a really big goal relating to over half this community. Requiring change and transformation we cannot yet even imagine, but we must try. One memory is instructive as we think about that. Fifty years ago, a great disciple, preacher, and scholar was dean of the chapel at the University of Chicago. Barney Blakemore, in one of his printed sermons, memorable printed sermon, analyzed in fine theological detail why the plans of the city of Chicago and the university were for civic betterment and the agitation of the Woodlawn organization and the back of the yards group were destructive. Meanwhile, friends of the poor and dispossessed all around the country were lauding Woodlawn and the back of the yards and their leader, Saul Alinsky, as the model for confronting entrenched privilege in the city. We asked 50 years later, who was right? The preacher or the prophet? Who knows? But the struggle was necessary and there was transformation. There continues to be transformation. Along the way, a young Kenyan-American came back from Harvard to that cauldron of community organizing in South Chicago. He was transformed, and so, some would say, was his nation. Bloomington is faced with rapid social change and institutional change now as Chicago was in the 1960s. We may negotiate that change well. If we as faith communities represent not only ourselves, but those who lacking power have come to depend on us, 
That is definitely what we are learning in our cooperation with other congregations. Change will come. Let it be intentional, inclusive transformation. Oh, you've been in a place like this, maybe coming out of your driveway this morning. One more illustration. Cyprus has a range of mountains like those in Greek mythology where the gods were supposed to reside. They are called the Olympus Mountains. In February, the Mediterranean beaches are warm for swimming on Cyprus. And monuments to Aphrodite and the Roman ruins fascinate. But residents say, to know Cyprus, you have to take the short, steep drive up to Mile High Trudos Mountain, a challenge for little European cars on the narrow road. At the top, on a February day, snow swirled suddenly, but there was refuge in the inevitable gift shop. Exiting the shop, one found the ground still glistening with a new covering of snow and sleet. The landscape of the peak was transfigured and glowing, but it appeared a little dangerous how to get down on the slippery, curving road. So into the roadway you go. Was there a safe way down? Turning through this dazzling scene onto the roadway around a curve, a hundred yards down, the snow cover ended. The road was clear. Vegetation was green. And the transformation was behind, but never forgotten. The transforming of the Olympus Mountains. The disciples had to come down off the mountain with Jesus, right into his inevitable confrontation and suffering, his terrifying but saving passion. And that's life as Jesus modeled it on the mountain and coming down from it. Those who remember the moments of transfiguration will be, if they so intend, transformed for this old world's sake into Jesus' very image. Thank you, Roger.